New Jersey, where the school system in New Jersey, um, we're looking at their numbers of um, non-binary. So if someone asked me this morning, well, what does non-binary mean? That means binary is male and female. So uh, someone who claims to be non-binary, they're saying <coughs> that they are neither um, male or female, or they are they, they're, they're male but they think they're female, or they're female but they think they're male, or they think they're no gender at all. So any of those combinations, right? We mentioned the, the 107 uh, yesterday, different gender identities. So they looked at how many kids in the New Jersey school system identified as being uh, non-binary, and uh, in um, let me look at the the article again. I copied and pasted the, the numbers, but they said in the 2019 um, to 2020 school year there were only 16 students who identified as being non-binary. So then they, um, that number they said is now ballooned in the 22 to 23 school year to uh, 675 students. So that is an increase of 4,118% um, of kids who identify as being non-binary. Um, so that's from the 2022 school year to 2019. So three years, uh, they've experienced a 4,000 percent increase in kids who identify. Um, and then there was a survey that was conducted by the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention uh, that was done in April, and it found that approximately one in four high school students now consider themselves to be LGBTQ. So, you know, you see the numbers are just skyrocketing. I think there are a number of reasons why that is. We talked a little bit about that yesterday. Um, I think it's the echo chamber that the kids are in in social media. Um, I'm trying to remember the, 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 the novel and then the movie, um, the Lord of the Flies, um, where uh, the gist of the, the novel is that uh, a group of school children are marooned on a desert island and they establish their own civilization basically, their own government. And after a period of time, it just falls apart, where they're killing each other and, and so forth. And, and uh, it's a commentary of what happens when, well, in this case, it was adult authority. I think it would happen to all of us if authority completely was removed. Even adults, we would turn on each other, I'm afraid. Um, but I think it's a, a good example of what happens with social media, because the kids are so that they are in the world without adult supervision. And um, they're just feeding off of each other. And we'll talk a little bit today about um, all those things, authority and so forth. Well, let me get started because we it's an hour and a half, but it's, there's so much to, to cover. And I want to finish with a, a video. It's a beautiful testimony of someone who was trans. And the, the key word there is was. Um, but a beautiful testimony. That's how we're going to end, and I want to make sure that we get to that, that video. So let's pray together. Mm. Oh, gracious Father, Lord, as we tackle the subject this morning, please uh, remind each of us that we're talking about people whom you love. Mm -hmm. uh, and I pray, Father, that we would handle this topic with respect and um, as, as children of God, as, as people made in, in the image of God, whether they, they know it or not, they're made in your image and they are in need of, of redemption. Um, and so I pray, Father, that, that you just bless our time together and uh, may your spirit be with me in Christ's name. Amen. 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 So if, <clears throat> excuse me, let me give you just a quick review of what we covered yesterday. In case you weren't here, and some of you weren't here for yesterday's seminar, um, we talked about gender dysphoria and what gender dysphoria is. It's when a person is unhappy with their biological sex, and they believe that there is, um, and it's a strong feeling. It's, that it's I, I stressed this yesterday. People who have gender dysphoria is not something that they would choose. It's not something that people, most people, typically wake up one morning and say, "I think I am a." a man living in a woman's body, or vice versa. It's, um, it's a strong feeling, it's a persistent feeling, it's oftentimes described as being stuck in the wrong body. And people who suffer from gender dysphoria, they experience as a result of this, distress. I mean, they are, uh, there's a high rate of dis um, depression, um, they are 
living in anguish. Um, they are conflicted people. And we, we make a mistake if we, we resort to, to calling people who are struggling this way as, as perverts or, or freaks or, or disgusting. And, and I mentioned in the church we haven't always done a very good job of ministering to those people who are struggling um, by referring to them as, as these kinds of things. They are, they are sufferers. They are people that, um, um, as I mentioned, they're, create, they're made in the image of God, and, and they're seeking to restore the image of God, and they just don't know how to get there. So it's an unchosen experience. It's not something that they would, would choose to, to, um, to do, and it's not something that we should just tell people, we'll just get over it and, and, and fix this, you know, start thinking correctly. Um, historically, gender and sex have always meant the same thing. And it's only within the past 10 to 15 years, really, that it's now a dichotomy, that gender somehow means something else um, than, than sex. But it's always, up until 15 years ago or so, it was always the same thing. Now, when you talk about gender, you're talking about a social construct. It's a feeling. It's how you feel about yourself, where sex is the, the biological uh, side of it. So. Uh, gender has been co-opted to mean how you feel about yourself. Uh, gender dysphoria is the only mental health issue, we talked about this yesterday, um, where um, we attempt to change the body to meet the thinking. Um, all other mental health issues, we address the thinking to match reality. So an anorexic, uh, someone who struggles with an eating disorder, you don't tell them um, you need to change your body to, to match your thinking. Uh, we tell them, we need to change your thinking to match the reality of, of your body, right? So, um, we don't reinforce delusions, but we reorient people to reality. It's always been the, the approach to mental health disorders until we, we got there. So that's a review from yesterday in a nutshell. So what we're going to do today is to look at scripture, and scripture does speak about this. Now, if you were to ask me to preach a half hour sermon, Oh, it's so hard for me to preach a half-hour sermon, maybe a 40-minute sermon, <laughs> on this issue. And, and you wanted me to, to um, do a topical sermon on transgender and to put all of the Bible texts together to talk about this issue. It would be a very short sermon. Um, there are more verses, more passages that address homosexuality than transgender. And so some people are tempted to think, well... The Bible's silent on this issue, and so we should be silent on this issue. We encourage people who feel this discongruence um, to pursue it. Um, but maybe the, the, the best known, clearest verse that deals with transgender is Deuteronomy 22.5. And it says, A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. So I've heard some people argue when you present this text. <laughs> um, those uh, in the transgender movement, I've heard um, trans females. A trans female is a man who thinks he's a woman. Okay. Um, I've heard some say, well, in the Bible, men were wearing dresses. So, um, you know, in the context of Deuteronomy 22.5, I can just wear a dress. It's, it's fine. But it, if you understand the context, what he's talking about is, is people wearing the clothing that's appropriate for, um, culturally appropriate for identifying um, whether they're male or, or female. But there aren't a lot of texts. There aren't a lot of passages that um, address the transgender issue. So um, the Bible at times gives us do's and don'ts. But most of the time, what Scripture does is it gives us principles. We have to look at the principle, and we have to figure out an application of those, those principles. Um, so uh, it gives us more like a 40,000-foot view of reality of the world, the way that we live. And um, so we need to just take those broad principles of Scripture and apply them. So uh, I'm going to put up on the, the screen over here where we're going today. These are biblical principles that we're going to be pursuing, and we'll go through each one of those. And I just put the bullets, and then you can fill out the, the notes um, on each of these as we, as we go through. So um, the first one is decisions. So to explain this principle, I need to start with some questions. 
Um, do you really believe what you believe is real? Do you really believe what you believe is real? And if I were to ask you why, how would you answer that? How do you know what you believe is the real thing? So um, that question leads to deeper questions. Questions like, what is reality? What is the nature of the world around us? What is a human being? Why is it possible for us to know anything at all? And how do we know right from wrong? So you may not have ever consciously answered those questions. But all of us has to answer. All of us have to answer those questions. Uh, we either do it intentionally or we do it passively, but we are unconsciously. But we all have to wrestle with those questions. And these are questions that um, young people are wrestling with, especially at that point in their life. They're trying to figure out what is reality? Um, uh, what is the nature of the world? How do I interact with the world around me? Is it possible to know anything at all? But they're important questions to answer because how you answer the question determines what your worldview is. Doesn't relativism play into this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that does play into relativism, and, and we'll um, unpack how that does um, in, in just a, a second. So we all have a worldview, and if you're not familiar with that term, a worldview is just the sum of your beliefs. It's what you believe to be true. And uh, at the deepest level, it's what steers your choices, um, either consciously or unconsciously. Uh, is what gives you ultimate meaning and where your reality is found. So everybody has one. So how, let me ask the question, how do we determine what is right and what is wrong? Well, there are three things I think that play into making decisions about what is right and what is wrong. Um, the first one is, what is our source of authority? What is our source of authority? So what that gets down to is, who has the right to tell me what to do? So who has authority? The, the next step in making a decision is uh, we look for a source of knowledge. So who knows what's best for me? So when you're making a decision and you're doing research, one of the things that you're looking for is who knows what's best for me, right? Makes sense. And then the third, the final part of making a decision is we look to a source that has trustworthiness. So, who loves me and who wants the best for me? So, if you find a person or you find an institution or you find a book that has all three of those things, that has authority, it has knowledge, it has trustworthiness, then that's where you're going to turn to make all of your decisions. So, that impacts every decision. It impacts your decisions about family, it impacts your decisions about um, uh, your political ideology, your religion, about your friends, about your entertainment, um, about science, about feelings. So if you think about all of the daily choices that you make, I want to give you an example of how this works, the authority, knowledge, and trustworthiness. If I, So here's a practical uh, application. <clears throat> So if I'm wrestling with the question, should I have ice cream? Should I have ice cream today? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I repeated the question twice because every time I've given this seminar, someone <laughs> says yes, right? Uh, and I like I like that answer, but um, I mentioned yesterday that my wife is of Italian descent. Um, her mother is half Italian, half Eritrean. If you're not familiar with the country of Eritrea, it's right next to Ethiopia. It was an Italian colony, thus, that's how my um, wife's grandparents met. Uh, he was an Italian diplomat in Eritrea. She was an Eritrean. So anyway, um, if you've ever been to Italy, you know that um, when you order gelato ice cream, <laughs> yeah. right? Well, how can you say it's ice cream? It's not ice cream. So much better. But what's the serving size like? It's three euros, but it's like this, right? So when my wife and I were, were just dating, she was over at my house, and I and we were watching a movie, a movie or something, and I asked her if she'd like some ice cream. She said, sure, I'd like a little ice cream. And so I'm from Alabama. I don't know about how you eat uh, ice cream in Maine. Um, but I had this bowl that was about this big around and this deep. 
probably took half a gallon carton of ice cream and bite it in half, <laughs> gave her half, gave me half. And I already knew I loved her, so I was treating her well, right? And I walked in and I gave her this, and she looked at it and she says, Oh my, what is this? <laughs> she was expecting just a little bit of, of ice cream. So if the, the question is, so should I have ice cream? Well, I could, I could listen to my feelings and I think, well, it tastes good, so yes, I'll have ice cream. Or I could listen to reason and say, oh, you know what? Every time I have something with dairy, my belly aches for hours. I'm not going to sleep tonight. So no, I'm not going to have any ice cream. Or you could use the way that you were raised and, and say, you know, I think I'm going to pass on the ice cream because um, I shouldn't have too much sugar. You know, it, it will lower my immune system is what mom always said. And so I'll, I'll pass on the ice cream. Or you could even be thinking spiritually. Spiritually about ice cream? Well, yeah, you can say, well, <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm fasting and, um, you know, I, I'm going to say no to the ice cream today. I have to say very good. Do it good like a medicine. <laughs> right. I'm, gonna fast from, I'm fasting from sugar today, so I'm not going to have that. So there are lots of authorities that we go to when we're making decisions. You see that? So I mean, wonder, why does any of this matter? Why does ice cream matter when we're talking about sexuality and, and gender? So the thing is, if we differ, if we differ in who our authority is, if we differ in who our, our knowledge, where we get our knowledge from, if we differ on where our trust, what we consider to be trustworthy in our decision making, we all begin in the same place in the beginning of making the decision. But if the, if the authority and the trustworthiness and the knowledge are different for each one of us, you can see how we're all going to end in different places. We start in the same process, but we end in different places based on what we look to for those things. So every single one of us is on a journey to different answers, and every journey begins with the question of, of how do I decide how to live? Does that make sense? So how do I decide how to live? But something has happened in our culture. Authority has been attacked. Hasn't it? Yes. I mean, you see it. You see it everywhere. You see Christian scandals. And we've not just in the evangelical church, we've had our own scandals within the Adventist church, unfortunately. Um, I saw a survey that was done, it was, it was a survey based on ethics of professions. It listed all these different professions that it rated the most ethical, and then they worked their way down to the least ethical. And pastors in general rated right under used car salesmen. <laughs> that made me feel really good. <laughs> but it was based on all the scandals that have impacted the Christian church. Right? Of course, we all get thrown in together, right? So um, priest scandals and all of that, um, you know, falls, it all gets lifted together in people's minds. But when you, um, so there have been Christian scandals. Um, have there been any political scandals? Anybody like losing trust in, in um, the authority of, of politicians? Um, even for a long time. even something like science, right, that is yeah. supposed to be apolitical has become politicized. We've seen that happen. And, um, at times, science that's supposed to be impartial, unbiased, at times is obviously biased and, and used to manipulate people and people's behavior. But I think we've thrown out the baby with the bathwater when we've rejected them. And, and some of those things we should reject as, as having authority over us. But in rejecting the, the bad of authority, I think we have thrown way too much out with it. So if we reject authority, what does that leave us with? It leaves us with knowledge and trustworthiness to make decisions, right? So based on, not you, but based on culture, in general, when you look around outside of the church, what's the default source of knowledge? TikTok. The internet. Google. Mainly Google, TV. right? Yeah. Or your friend. The internet, Google, well, right? Do you remember? Uh, you remember the day when you didn't know something? Yeah. And you had to actually research it by like getting in the car on your bike and going to the library and yeah, and look, kind of getting the card catalog and the decimal system and finding a book and, and reading. But now nothing goes unanswered. You can have the answer to any question instantly, right? Uh, 
And, and a lot of times it's just based on someone else's opinion, right? That's what they de determine to have authority. So um, Google is our default source of knowledge culturally. So what's the default source of trustworthiness? So we've thrown out authority uh, as a culture, we reject authority, now we're less knowledge, trustworthy is now me. Yeah. I mean, I can't trust anybody, anybody more than I can trust myself, uh, right? Uh, yeah. And what I think, huh. what I think, that's the what I think, what I feel, self is the ultimate of trustworthiness. So, I mean, who has more of a right to tell me what to do than me? Who knows better than me? So, how many times have you heard people say, "Well, I think," right? Yeah. Or, "I feel," or "My truth," but truth is constant. Um, if it's not constant, then it's not truth. Oh. It's, not, it's an opinion. So, I mentioned, I gave an example yesterday. You, you know, you can say, well, my gravity says that I can jump out of this plane and I will fall. Well, let's see how well that works out for you. Yeah. So, this is something that if we're, if we're basing our, our self as trustworthiness, we need to understand something about ourselves. Um, I mentioned yesterday that we live in community. Every decision that we make doesn't just impact ourselves, it impacts other people. Mm -hmm. um, sure. And many times adversely. Uh, second, do I really know myself that well? Mm. Um, I was going to say, I don't know about you, but I do know about you. Uh, it's the same as me. This is the first time I've lived this life. Um, you know, I don't know what I don't know. And, and I'm, I'm learning, right? And, and I can identify ways that I feel unfulfilled but I don't know at times that my solution is the best. Sometimes I think I know it's best for me. Um, what would your life look like today if you had acted on every thought, every feeling that, that looked good to you? As I was thinking of this, I was thinking, I've, I don't know how old I was, but I thought that if I flapped my arms really hard and jumped off my roof of my house, I could actually fly. Um, I never tried that, obviously, but um, um, we always think that there are things that are best. I mean, how many times have you made a decision and you actually did all the research that you could and you thought, this is a really wise decision, and then you got to the, you made the decision, and then you reevaluated and you thought, oh man, I blew that one. Right. So I have to ask myself continually, am I really to be trusted to want what's best for me? Because there's a part of me that always wants something it's not good for me, like a giant bowl of ice cream. Yeah. So it turns out that self isn't the best place to look for authority, knowledge, and trustworthiness. So there's a better source, um, there's a greater source, and that starts in the very first verse of the very first book of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's our source. Um, he is creator, and as a creator, he has authority, right? Um, because I'm part of the creation, he has the right to speak to me, to tell me what to do. He knows what's best for me. But all of us have to answer the question for ourselves, is God really good? Is he really good? Why should I trust the creator to tell us what's best for us? Well, I would say the answer for that is the evidence is astoundingly positive. Yes, you can trust him. Yes, he is really good. And you can do that because what he has done for us. Yeah. For yeah. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? So when we understand God as our authority, we can understand texts like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, where he says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. and all your ways submit to him. And he will make your path straight. And when you understand him as the creator and the source of authority, we understand that these aren't just commands, they're promises. So the Bible reveals to us the basis for all of our decisions. God has the authority, and he demands obedience. And he has the character that deserves respect. He has the authority, he's the source of knowledge, he's trustworthy. So that's the basis for our decisions. That's bullet number one, how we make decisions. He's got to be the basis. So second is design. Um, whenever I fly, and I did this Sunday, as I left Asheville, North Carolina, flew to Atlanta, 
I'm starting to think that even when at the second coming, I'm going to have to be routed through Atlanta first. <laughs> it's crazy. But every time I get on a plane, um, as you're walking down and you, you cross over that, that threshold, step into the plane, um, you see the flight attendant. The flight attendant is standing there and, and he or she greets you, smiles, welcome aboard, right? Um, I don't look at the flight attendant. I look to the left. <laughs> and I know you can't judge a book by the cover, but I'm looking at that pilot. Right? Is he sober? Right, is he sober? I'm looking to see if he's standing upright, if I speak to him, if his speech is slurred. Um, I'm looking at a space to see how many flight hours does this guy have, right? Um, I used to hate it when people um, well, people still do. I was going to say, I, hate, I used to hate it when people judge me ba based on my age, based on my looks. I'm 53. I, I've been told I don't look it. But um, I hate it when people sum me up by, by my age. But I do that to pilots. If he looks like he's just right out of college, I'm like, has he flown this plane before? Yeah. <laughs> That's what doing, right? But it's a whole lot more than just the way the pilot looks. You're talking about systems, right, that have been designed by someone and you know, fail-safe systems and so forth, and I'm hoping that they really are fail-safe. And um, we have a designer. We have a designer, and he had a plan yes. of how, we would make the world, how he would make the world, and once he had created it, he stood back and he says, ah, oh, this is very good. Right. It wasn't average, it wasn't purposeless, and not only that, he made us in his image. We're not identical to him, but we're similar moral aspects and spiritual aspects and relational aspects were all the culmination of God's infinity, his infinite wisdom and skillful creation. So this is my point. God knew you before you were born. Yeah. He formed your innermost parts. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And he didn't make a mistake. Yeah. Didn't make a mistake. So no one, not the state, not any philosophy, not any social movement can give humanity more dignity and worth than what God can, God has done. So our, our core values come not from ourselves, our core value rather doesn't come from ourselves. You're not valuable because of just who you are. You're valuable because of who your creator is. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, at my home, in our guest room, uh, we use the space under the bed. No one here does that, but we use the space under the bed to store things, right? It's plastic um, sterilite. I use the brand box that my wife uses. And we ran out of storage space under the guest bed, so you know what we did? We put blocks under the bed frame. <laughs> so I, our guests have to have a ladder to get out of the bed. In one of those um, boxes with some cedar chips, um, are these clothes, these baby clothes. Mm -hmm. And um, at 53, we're not planning on having any more children, right? But we still hold on to them, especially, there is this, um, this sweater. It's um, a light green sweater, as I recall. It's been a few years since it's been out of the box, but um, you know, my, youngest, my youngest child is 22. My mm -hmm. oldest one will be 34 in October. And uh, none of them are going to get into this sweater but we still have it. And so um, it's been passed on from every one, the oldest down to the youngest, they all wore this, this sweater. And we haven't gotten rid of that sweater because the sweater is really, it's really special. When you, when you look at it and you look at the back collar, there's not a tag on it because um, it wasn't made in a factory. In fact, um, our kid's great-grandmother, the one from Eritrea, actually knitted the sweater. So she picked every piece of yarn and she knitted it and she was thinking of her great-grandchildren. And so we keep that sweater today, not because it has value because it's usable, but it has value because of its creator. It's mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Yeah. We'll never get rid of that thing. It's going to be passed on from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. So all of this that we're talking about, it isn't a debate between transgenders and cisgenders. And remember, cisgenders just refers to someone that feels like they're their gender and their, their sexuality match, right? Um, it's not a debate between cisgenders and transgenders. It's not a debate between religious people and secular people. This is a question about whether a creator has the right to speak about his creation. Yeah. Yeah. So let me add, 
God does not create gender confusion. He doesn't create confusion. He is not the author of confusion. The God that creates is the God who tells us who we are. And we cannot recreate ourselves. We should not seek to undo. So you may not have ever seen that as a, a text about transgenderism. Um, but Jesus did speak to the topic right there in that passage. So we covered um, decisions. We've covered design. That is God's design. And then next we're going to look at um, dysfunction. So when we left Adam, we were just talking about Genesis 1-1. When we left Adam and Eve, all is good. But you know the rest of the story. <coughs> the fall came, right? Rather than looking to God as their authority, seeking his knowledge, trusting him, they trusted in their own reasoning. Uh, they felt like they had their own authority, right? They thought they had their own knowledge that superseded what God had said. And so they created an alternative lordship. And that was self. And what took them down takes us down. And every, and every aspect of creation is marred by what happened in Genesis. So, sometimes we think of, of the story of Adam and Eve as ancient history. But it's actually, um, their story is my story. Um, none of us can, can point an accusatory finger in anyone who disagrees with us on transgender issues because we are all marred by sin. Okay. And we all contribute to our own brokenness um, by our own sinful choices. Now, we all sin differently. You know, your sin may not look like my sin, but we, we all sin, and, we're, and all of our sin is equal in sin. Amen. We're all lost outside of Christ. Mm. Um, not only do we all sin, but... Humans break. Uh, I was at the, the gym in um, 2019. I was on the treadmill and I was running. And um, I, all of a sudden I felt this pain right here. Uh, that's weird. And so I, I hit the stop button. I held onto the side. And um, I was breathing a little heavy. I was hurting. But I rested and then that twinge went away. And, um, and I thought... You know, that feels like it could be my heart. But then I thought, hey, I'm in good shape. It's not my heart, right? I, I've had my uh, cholesterol checked. My cholesterol is like around 100. My triglycerides are great. I exercise every day. Uh, I used to. Um, so everything can't be my heart. And then a couple weeks later, my wife asked me to carry a box from her van upstairs. And we have a split level house. And so I made it to the landing. And that pain came back. This time, I had been running, so it was more obvious when the sweat came. Oh, yeah. And she, she looked at me, and I'm sitting on, I'm standing like here, pale. She said, Eric, what are you doing? I said, give me a second. Well, you can guess. This, the first time in the gym, she wasn't there. She was there for this. I had a stress test. I had an emergency heart cath. They found that my widow maker was 80% occluded. Mm -hmm. um, caught everybody by surprise. And um, I, I told the cardi even the cardiologist, the cardiologist said, you know, you have an abnormal stress test. It's only slight. There's a little thing going. I think it's just from you bouncing up and down the treadmill. But since you have pain on exertion, let's go ahead and take a look. And so I remember laying on the table and he goes, your LAD artery is 80% occluded. I'm going to have to put a stand on <coughs> What? And he was surprised. I was surprised, right? Um, no more ice cream. No more ice cream. <laughs> By the way, I asked him, I said, how can that be? My cholesterol is low. And he said, I can really stress. Right. Right. Yeah. stress. Stress causes your cortisol level to go up, which causes uh, the little bit of cholesterol that you have to, like, get stuck. And you produce more of it anyway. Um, I have to, to de-stress, right? Ice cream. So my point is, <laughs> you guys are leading me astray. <laughs> We're failing, every single one of us, all right? And in November, I had a spinal fusion done. Ooh, you L5S1. So the reality is that we are broken, living in a, living in a fallen creation. 6,000 years of sin has taken a toll on humanity. And this is the key to our, not just our bodies are broken, but our minds are broken as well. Um, we're broken actors, and we're on a broken stage, 
and we, we do not stand on the stage very long. How's that for encouragement? Sounds <laughs> <laughs> like Shakespeare. Yeah. Yeah. So Jeremiah tells us that our hearts are deceitful. The emotions that we feel, the emotions of bitterness and greed and envy, all tell us that we're deceived to thinking that we won't be satisfied until we get what our hearts desire. Yeah. But this is the key. Those who distress about their gender identity have <coughs> authentic experiences. Yes. Their heart's desire is telling them one thing about themselves, while their physical body is saying something else. Yeah. But experiencing the feeling does not mean feeding it. I feel stuff all the time that I have to walk away from. I can't feed it. So thinking that I can change my body to match my feelings will bring peace is a fallacy. It's not true. So we mentioned yesterday, those who transition have a higher rate of depression, have higher rates of suicide um, after transitioning, even though, even when they live in accepting cultures like Denmark and Norway, etc., the studies have shown. So experiencing gender dysphoria, I want to be clear, experiencing gender dysphoria is not a sin. Are we clear on that? Yeah. And, and this may catch you off guard as well, and let me unpack it, but same-sex attraction. I know this is a transgender seminar, but uh, homosexuality, same-sex attraction, those feelings are not sin. Okay? That's right. It's what we do with it. <clears throat> but... Experiencing gender dysphoria is an indicator of the brokenness of humanity that's due to sin. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when we let feelings rule, to feed the feeling so that's the way you see yourself, the way you identify, the way you dress is sinful. Because it is deciding that your feelings have authority over you. And feelings define what is right and wrong. Does that make sense? So to transition is to sin. Well, let me add this. It is not the sin. Does that, does that make sense? It's a sin, but it's not the sin. It's not the unpardonable sin. It is not in a hierarchy of sin. It is not up here where what you said about the driver who cut you off yesterday is not here. Right? Did I go from preaching to manual? Sorry. It's, it's not... It's not worse than lust, it's not worse than adultery, it's not worse than envy, it's not worse than greed, and all those other sins that other people try to misuse. Although I would say this is a sin with irreversible consequences. If you, ever, if you go to YouTube, you can watch video after video of people who are detransitioning. And they have some powerful testimonies of what God has done but they bear permanent scars yeah. for what they did. Yeah. Beautiful young ladies that are missing this part of their, the muscle on their arm where they had a penis made out of it. Yeah. Um, and just permanently scarred. Um, they can be forgiven, but it has irreversible consequences. A friend of mine, um, I met him as a colleague in ministry in the Gulf States Conference, so that's Georgia. Uh, it's Georgia. Alabama, Mississippi, Panhandle, Florida. He was a colleague of mine, fellow pastor. Before he became a Christian, he was an IV drug user. And he was exposed, contracted hepatitis. And the hep hepatitis did incredible damage to his liver. And mm. a year ago, he died of liver cancer. It was related to the damage that the hepatitis had done. Was he forgiven for using IV drugs? Absolutely. But he did pay, pay a price for it. No, absolutely. So sin has consequences leaves an imprint on us. Sometimes I hear people just throw up their hands and they say, well, <coughs> I sin, so does everybody else. I'm pretty good, especially especially compared to others. Have you noticed that's how we compare ourselves when it comes to sin with other people? It's we look at the people who sin worse than we do. Right? right? Not less, that we perceive as less. We look at the people that sin worse, and that makes us feel better about who we are. But God never leaves us where we are. He never leaves us in our sinful condition. He is in the process of restoration. He's in the process of remodeling. Um, you may not know this about pastors, but we 
We tend to buy fixer-up houses. Because they're cheaper, right? And then because, um, because we're cheap, um, we do most of the repairs ourselves, right? And um, so every house, and there's something about my wife and I and our luck when we have moved districts. We always move at the worst time. The worst time in the market. We always buy high and sell low. In 22 years of ministry, you'd think we'd figure the timing out, but when God calls, we, we move. So I, I told my current church, we've been there nine years in, in Asheville, and I, I told them, well, we can't move anytime soon because the seller's market is too good, right? Because <laughs> that's not the way it works for us. I mean, we would make a killing if we sold right now. Um, but then, where would we move? And what would we be able to afford? Is there anything about beer? About beer. In, my, in our last house in, in Alabama, in, in Dothan, I was remodeling a master bathroom, and um, we, uh, we needed a new shower. The shower was leaking, and so I decided I was going to expand the size of the shower, and, and, and I, I built this wall, and it was really, when I did that, it blocked the, the big window that was in the bathroom. By the way, why would they put a big window in a bathroom? That's amazing. Right. Anyway, the, the wall I built for the shower blocked the light coming in through the window, so now the shower is very dark. So I decided in the wall I would put the block uh, glass Right. Just a, a row of, I think it was four of those blocks in there to let some of the light in. And so um, I tiled the shower, I tiled around the, the window, the block glass. And tiling around that block glass was the last thing that I did. And the very last piece of tile that I installed was uh, one of the, the corner pieces. So I cut it at a 45 degree angle and I, I put it in. And I was so exhausted by that point. This was a, a remodeling project. You've done remodeling projects yourself? Yeah, it took me about six months longer than it should have. The bathroom was not usable for that long. And my wife every day was like, do you think you might have to work on the bathroom today? Um, so when I finally got done, I was, I was done. And I just walked away. Well, the next day when I was using that shower for the first time, I looked at that uh, tile job around the window and I realized I was using bull nose tile around the glass so it would look finished. Well, the last piece of tile, I cut the 45 degree angle on the wrong side of the tile. And so the 45, or excuse me, the bull nose, that curved part of the tile was against the glass rather on the, out, than the outside edge. And it was just, it was different from everything else. Right. It was wrong. And I'm embarrassed to say that I looked at that and I just went, that's good enough. <laughs> so we were, ten, we were 10 years in that house. It was like eight years left after the bathroom remodel. Eight years, every day, I'm looking at that piece of house. <laughs> and I could have taken a little chisel, knocked it out, and fixed it, but I was, nice, that's good enough. That's good enough. The good news is that God never looks at us in our sinful condition and says, that's good enough. Yeah. 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 I've done what I can, I'm just going to walk away. <laughs> I'm never going to get arrogant, cleaned of all that sin, so I'm just going to stop there. Um, he never leaves us there. He continues to work, continuing to redeem us. So that's, uh, so that's the destruction of the design and what God is, is doing in us. And that leads us to bullet number four which is delayed future. What we see in gender dysphoria is people created in the image of God trying to break free from the effects of the fall by following the course of the fall in their own life and decisions. So they realize, subconsciously or consciously, that they fall short, as each of us does. <coughs> but their pursuit of measuring up or of stepping up is actually going in the path of the, the fall. So the question is, is there hope? Can transgender people find wholeness? Can they find psychological relief? Can they find emotional relief? So the Bible's message is the same for the transgender as for the rest of us. And that means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old is gone. A new life has begun. So here's an offer that God extends to all of us. We can be a new creation. But catch this, being a new creation does not mean that the struggles of this world stop today, right? How many of you are adult converts? Besides me, okay, good number, right? 
And as soon as, as an adult, you profess your belief in Christ Jesus, all of a sudden, your life fell into place. And everything was smooth sailing from there on. Yeah. Oftentimes, the closer we get to Christ, the rockier our way. So we live, I, I read a book that called it the, the gospel gap. The gospel gap. It means we experience the gospel of the cross here, right? And we know that the gospel means that down here, Christ is coming back to get us. But we're living in the gap right now. We're living between the cross and the second coming. That's where the rubber meets the road, isn't it? Uh, so being a new creation doesn't mean that the struggles of the world go away. Our bodies and our minds haven't been totally free. We haven't been totally set free yet. So dysphoria doesn't become euphoria instantly. Uh, it does, it's not like this. All of a sudden, the, that confusion is, is gone once you walk with Christ. Much of what we experience here isn't going to be made right. Until Christ comes and he makes everything yeah. new. Yeah. Gender dysphoria is a deep, painful struggle. It causes pain, it causes anguish, it causes tears. But it's not the only struggle. Mm -hmm. The whole world struggles. Mm -hmm. The whole world cries out. The good news is that God has heard the groans. He's heard and he's going to renew creation. He's going to make it all right. Mm -hmm. So not only will the feelings of dysphoria be removed, but the conditions that give rise to dysphoria in the first place will be eradicated. So sometimes when we come to Christ, we are instantly delivered. Um, have you ever heard someone say, you know, when I accepted Christ, I was a heavy smoker, and I never had a desire for another cigarette before. Have you heard that? Yeah. Yeah. Those people used to irritate me so much. I just couldn't stand those people. Because when I came to Christ, I was a smoker. I started smoking when I was 13. And my wife and I came to Christ together. Um, we, were, we were baptized together when we were 20. We already had our first child. We started early. And um, for the first five years that I was a Seventh-day Adventist, this may shock me. Um, you may just get up and walk out of here now. Uh, the first five years after I became an Adventist, between Sabbath school and church, I would drive around the corner from the church to a little shop a snack or a convenience store, and I would smoke a couple of cigarettes. See, I, I quit smoking long enough to get wet, as they call it. I got baptized, and then the struggle, I went back to smoking. So for five years, um, between Sabbath school and church, I would go grab a cigarette and tell my wife, if anybody invites us to lunch today, or for, for, uh, they're home for, for lunch on Sabbath, don't accept, because I can't go that long without a cigarette. <clears throat> I had this monkey on my back. And, and so quitting was... I tell people, quitting smoking was easy. I did it dozens of times. Uh, <laughs> so, let me reassure you, I half quit. Okay. I, did, I did get the, the victory, but, um, yeah, praise God, right? But it took failing lots of times. And it took coming back to Jesus over and over, and trusting Him, and learning to trust Him, to turn to Him after I fall, and, and learning to to be able to say no to the things that the flesh crave. And in this gap, that gospel gap that I talked about between the cross and the second coming, between uh, the cross and, and our redemption coming, the second coming, God hasn't abandoned us. He hasn't left us. He sent us his comforter, right? And the spirit makes a difference. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, he says that the Spirit replaces our minds of flesh with minds of the Spirit. So we stop thinking as the world thinks as we grow in Christ. And we set our minds on new things. And the Spirit makes it possible, possible for me to know, to realize, to see the predicament that we're in. And it helps us to think, I'm groaning, but I'm also waiting for a time when I'm not going to groan anymore. So my suffering, my struggle, is for a little time. And the Spirit tells us what is good, even as our feelings are, tell us, are telling us something completely different. So in the Holy Spirit, or with the Holy Spirit, it's possible to desire to live as God wants out of love for Him, even as we are having other feelings that suggest that we should live as He doesn't want us to live. So God does not promise 
to take away any feelings of dysphoria. He doesn't promise that. But the gospel has the power to equip us to understand and respond to those feelings with the truth of God's word. Mm -hmm. So I like to, to think of it this way. We live in a Genesis 3 world with a Genesis 1 blueprint on the path to a Revelation 21 future. Yeah. So that brings us to number five, difficult paths. So someone with dysphoria experiences something that's radically different than I have ever experienced. You know, I can't say to someone who's struggling with gender dysphoria, well, I know how you feel, because it's radically different than what I've experienced. But at the same time, they're experiencing something that is radically common to all of us. I know the effects of brokenness in my life. I know the experience of something feeling right to me that is in direct contradiction to the Word of God. What God commands of me. And sometimes, sometimes the flesh is, is just completely, painfully opposed to what God wants to do. <laughs> and Jesus calls this cross-carrying. I used to think that the text said, that Jesus said, pick up my cross and follow me. Yeah. But he doesn't say that. He says, pick up your cross and follow me. Right? It's, it's death to self. It's my cross. So when Jesus told his disciples, pick up the cross, he's telling us to die daily. How do I do that? Yeah, daily. Yeah. daily. It's hard. Death is hard. Dying to self is hard. But it's not forever. Mm -hmm. It's not hard forever. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen this social experiment. Um, I saw it first on, I guess it was on YouTube, where... Um, sociologists did a study of kids and delayed gratification. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they did that. They put them in this room with marshmallows. Have you yeah. seen it? Yes. Yeah. Well, for the one or two of you that haven't seen the video, <laughs> let me explain it to you. So they, they sit a child there at the table and put in front of the kid a plate, a little plate with a marshmallow on it. And the tester says to them, um, I'm going to leave the room for about for eternity, like five minutes. And if you leave that marshmallow, if you don't eat it, then I've got something better for you. As I recall, I don't think they elaborate what the better is, um, but I've got something better for you. Maybe they do. Maybe it's more marshmallows. I don't know. But anyway, the point is, they said, if you leave it, then I'll come back in five minutes, and if it's still there, then, then you'll get more or something better. So then, of course, with the video rolling, the kids don't know the videos, uh, that they're being watched at all, right? But they are. <laughs> and the watching the kids is hilarious. You know, some have incredible self-discipline. Some are, you know, they look at that marshmallow and um, they will work hard not to be tempted and they'll look away. They'll have private conversations with them. Don't eat that marshmallow because there's something better that's coming. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And then there are others. This is the kind of kid that I was. They are looking for ways to... Um, you know, they can pick out the middle of that marshmallow and eat it, put it down on the plate, and it doesn't look like it's been touched. Others lick the marshmallow and put it down. Others, they just say, forget this, and they just pop the whole thing in and eat it. And then after the five minutes, the, the psychologist comes in, and, um, and if the, the marshmallow has not been touched, then, then they are rewarded, right? So... I think we all appreciate that, those, that video because it describes how we feel all the time, right? So denying what your mind tells you that you need, I need that marshmallow, or whatever it is, denying that um, is hard, right? So to live for Christ while you experience gender dysphoria is very hard. Christian life is hard. But it's not hard forever. That's what I want to stress to those who are struggling. It's not hard forever. There's something else that Jesus promises. So, in Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells his disciples that they will lose their houses. This is the Christian experience. You'll lose your houses. You'll lose your, your wives, your brothers, your parents. Um, you'll lose your children. For now, we've lost our kids. Um, a couple of grandkids that we haven't met. But he promises you'll receive more. Mm -hmm. receive more. So Jesus calls them to be faithful because he is faithful. 
He's faithful. Mm -hmm. Even though following Christ means a life that's hard, it's a better life mm -hmm. uh -huh. now and forever. Right. So the question is, do you trust him? Do you trust him? I want to leave you with a story, a personal story, and then a video. And um, great, we're doing great for time. How about that? Uh, pastoral ministry was, was not a first uh, career for me. It was actually second or, or third. Um, I mentioned that my wife and I came to Christ as, as adults. Um, and um, our lives were crazy. Um, so let me give the order of our life um, experience. Um, we had our first child at the age of 19 um, in October. We were married in December. Following the math so far? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then in May, we're baptized as Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not recommend this order of events. Yeah. <laughs> um, my first college major was architecture. And I dropped out of the program because I had a child on the way and I had to get a job and begin working. And then I worked for Blue Cross and Blue Shield in Alabama in customer service, so I got yelled at for a living. That was my job. And while doing that, I felt God leading me to go into nursing, so I did that in a night program. So I'd work all day at Blue Cross getting yelled at. Then I'd go to nursing school. I'd get home from clinicals about 12.30, 1 o'clock in the morning. I was up at 4.30 and go back to work at, at Blue Cross and did that. It was grueling. And um, life was, was very, very hard. Um, but it was after I finished nursing school that I began sensing the call to go into pastoral ministry. So six years after my baptism and after one year quitting smoking, <laughs> um, we packed up a rider truck and headed to Southern Adventist University from Birmingham. And uh, I was petrified. <laughs> um, but the calling on my life was, was more sure than anything else. Yeah. By the way, the cool thing is I was able to do um, home health while I studied theology. Mm -hmm. And my wife was able to stay at home with, at that point we had two sons, and she was able to stay home while I was going to school all day and then doing home health care. I'd go to Greek class in my scrubs and then make my home health visits around um, Greek and, and Old Testament studies and all those classes. So God provided. That's why he sent me to, to nursing school. But after a couple of years at Southern, we were expecting our third child. And we were really excited. My sponsoring conference wasn't really excited. Three kids. How are you going to support three kids in the ministry? That's what my ministerial director told me. But um, we were excited. And I thought, oh, I'm going to get my little girl. And um, so we went to the... the um, obstetrician for a regular um, appointment. In fact, this was the appointment when we were going to have the ultrasound done to find out the gender of our baby. So really excited. So we, uh, my wife is on the table. Uh, the ultrasound, the doctor actually is doing the, the ultrasound. And the doctor says, well, your baby is not as big as it should be at this time. So what I would like to do is refer you to a specialist, a perinatologist, um, and, and have them check and make sure that everything is fine. But I think everything is fine. But I just would feel more comfortable if you saw a specialist. So she was reassuring. So we were very confident. So we made our appointment um, in, in downtown Chattanooga at the teaching hospital. We had this fantastic perinatologist. He had this incredible <coughs> um, equipment, fancy ultrasound equipment, state-of-the-art, brand new color ultrasound stuff. Now that's old school. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was cool still. Wasn't 3D yet? This was um, in the early 90s, but it was cool nonetheless. And so the um, the perinatologist is, is doing the ultrasound, and I'm looking at him. I'm looking at my wife, and and we are smiling. And I notice that the perinatologist has a tear running down his cheek. And he said, "I don't know how to tell you this, but there's no heartbeat. Your child has died." Oh. Um, she was um, 21 weeks gestation. Mm -hmm. And so he said, I'm going to, to send you home, and in the morning, you need to come back to the hospital. You'll be admitted, mm -hmm. and we'll induce labor. You'll go through a full labor, mm -hmm. and you'll deliver this baby. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we did. We, the next day, we were in a, a labor and delivery room at a teaching hospital. So people would come in that really hadn't read the chart. Like I remember the, the nurse anesthetist came in, the um, uh, student, 
to, to do an epidural, because she's doing full labor, right? And um, the, the CRNA said, well, you don't look very big to be full-term having a baby. You didn't have an idea that we had lost this child. And so when our, our son was born, uh, we were the only two in the room. There was no one else there, just the two of us. And we held him and we cried. You know, that has been 20 plus years, 25 years ago. But I can tell you, although I didn't enjoy the process, I'm glad I went through it. Yeah. Because since I went through it, since we went through it, we've been able to have conversations with dozens and dozens of people who have experienced that loss. And we can say, we've walked with you. We can walk with you. Mm -hmm. And if nothing else, it was, it was worth it. Is that the right thing to say? Worth it. But there was a blessing in it. It was difficult, but there was a blessing in it. And that's what I would say to those who are, are struggling with gender dysphoria is, this is hard, but there's a blessing in it. And God will use it. That's enough for me. I want you to hear Jeffrey's story. Um, Jeffrey is a believer. He's not an Adventist. His, some of his theology is a little different than ours, and you'll catch, you may catch that. But his, this is a man who has experienced the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful story. So. Amen. I, I, love it. I didn't hear any bad doctrine either. Anyone yeah. Did you? Well, I, I know more about Jeffrey. His name's Jeffrey Johnston. Yeah. So I uh, follow others, so I've forgotten about this video. There are others where he's, he's Pentecostal, and so sometimes he'll go off in that vein. But, um, but yeah, he's, I think he lives in Maine now, actually. He's, a, he's our brother, right? Uh, I want to clarify, someone raised this question yesterday, and, and uh, I just want to make sure that I don't leave you from, with Jeffrey's testimony with the wrong idea. Not all trans females, that Jeffrey would have been a trans female, right? So if you take trans and replace it with not, so not female, so a trans female is a male who's living as a, a female. Um, not all trans females are gay. Um, that's a common misperception. No, and not all of them are prostitutes. Not all of them are, are strippers, as, as Jeffrey's testimony. Some um, are straight as far as they're you know, a male that dresses as a woman, lives as a woman, but they're attracted to, to women. So I just want to make sure that we were clear and not always assume that, that people who are transgender are also homosexual. Because that's offensive when we make assumptions about where people are. Yeah. Well, we have about um, nine minutes. Um, this is kind of dangerous. But <laughs> <laughs> questions. And uh, let me re assure you, I am not an ultimate expert. I'm just traveling this road out of necessity for my own family. Uh, I saw a hand over here first. Yes, ma'am. I was just down in college now, and they stopped the uh, university church. They're starting a reaching out program to the spectrum and they had one young man there who was in his 20s and he told his story about how he had gone to college there to the university you know the college there and i think he was studying theology i don't remember for sure i can't remember all the details but the thing is he he was living he finally gave it up and said "Fooly, i'm tired of being two-faced and he went to his living as a homosexual and then Kate decided to, I'm not quite sure the steps, but anyway, he came back to the Lord. And at this point, he is the youth leader in his local Adventist church. Yes, sir. Back. But he still has homosexual feelings. He just doesn't act on them. Right. What effect does uh, child abuse play on this community? Yeah, the, the question was what a, um, what effect or what impact does child abuse have on, on this community? And we talked yesterday, there's no common denominator. There's not one thread that you see through everybody that struggles with transgender. But there are some common things. So many of them do have half histories of being abused, molested. Um, 
Yeah, I know that if you're familiar with Michael Carducci and Coming Out Ministries, that's his story. He struggled with um, homosexuality and transgenderism, and, and he had been, and I can share his story um, because he shares it publicly as well, but um, he was molested and it helped, or it was one of the things that caused him to struggle with identity. Um, but not every transgender person has been abused or, or molested. Um, sometimes if something is, is Let's say as as small as, but I guess it's not. It, it isn't really small, but you know, to have a, a sibling say, you know, I wanted a sister. You should have been born a girl. Um, plants seeds. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, there are a number of, and then um, parental parents can can do it as well. Oh, I, I meant to add, and this is a good um, segue. Yeah, I'm gonna just follow where my my brain takes me. Um, and that is, um, it's very, very common, or there are a group of uh, different groups of transgender experiences. Um, it was very common for children to um, say things as they're little. It's de developmental, in fact, for a child to say, well, I'm a boy, mommy, when they're a girl. Or a little boy to say, I want to be a girl. Um, for a brother to wear a sister's dress. Um, that's very common. It's, it's developmentally normal. Um, but it seems like today, because of how heightened society is, culture is, that parents either panic when that happens and they shame children, uh, or the other extreme and say, oh, my child is trans. I need to encourage this, this behavior. So that's becoming more and more common. Uh, so that's just a normal development. And then, as I mentioned yesterday, then you have, this, it's mostly men, you have men who find some sort of eroticism by dressing up as a woman. Um, but that's not a transgender person. Transgenders don't normally, uh, transgenders do not become aroused by wearing women's clothing. They actually feel like they are a woman trapped in a man's body. So I just wanted to differentiate between different groups. Are you willing to um, schedule like on online Zoom seminars for like a local church or, the, or maybe conference-wide we could do something? Oh, uh, conference-wide maybe I would do that. Um, keep in mind I'm a part-time director of family ministries in my conference, so that's um, 23,000 members in the Carolina conference. And then I'm senior pastor of a church of, of 500 members, so I'm, wow. I'm running. You got so, money. I have many times that. <laughs> in, in my spare time. Do you have a book? I don't have a book. No. Um, we were wondering, because we deal with um, mission trips where people are Hindu, and I'm thinking about Muslims or whatever. Obviously, we believe the Bible. We believe God is the authority. How does that translate for people who don't believe in Christianity or the Bible? Do they have to become converted before they can um, get help? You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Um, can you, does it help for them to read their book and believe in their God? I, right. I don't know. Because, we, you know, we go to India every year. Right. Um, yeah. I'm not sure that I have a full full answer for that. Um, as I, I spoke in the plenary session, I think that the, the main role of, of changing is through the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit opening the eyes of our hearts so that we can see. Does the Holy Spirit work in the hearts of people who are unconverted? Um, yes. Um, so there is a role of work of the Holy Spirit in the heart to for someone to realize well, the path that I'm on is not filling that void that I'm seeking. So we can help someone who's not a believer to connect. You know, where you're going, where you're taking this is not going to bring you satisfaction. But let me go here. I saw your hand. I was just going to suggest, Erin, that you might coming out of ministries on the board yes. and just say a word about it. Because sure. when you say coming out of ministries, people might hear something that it's yeah. not. Yes, um, Coming Out Ministries is an Adventist ministry, an independent ministry, or self-supporting ministry, I think is the politically correct uh, term. Um, it is made of, made up of five co-founders, Seventh-day Adventists, who were in the, um, the gay lifestyle. 
and they experience the gospel and experience uh, redemption. Um, that to say that um, one of them, Ron Wolsey, who's a pastor in Arkansas, uh, is married to a woman. Um, others that are in the ministry, uh, like Michael Carducci, is, is not married. Uh, they will tell you that they still have uh, same-sex attraction. Uh, again, same-sex attraction is not a sin. It's what you do to it. with it. We're all called the holy sexuality. Uh, if you're outside of a marriage, marriage being one man, one woman, if you're outside of that, we're all called the celibacy, right? right. And so uh, that's their position. Um, they have a fantastic ministry. They, um, they speak at camp meetings. They have a website. Um, they have YouTube videos that are on um, a show on Hope Channel. So, you know, fantastic ministry. So, you can check that out. But they focus the more name, on homosexuality. Yeah, and the name coming out, of, coming out of ministries is Come Out of Earth, My People. Yeah. It's not the coming out of Coming out of the closet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you and then be done. Yeah. Yeah. So, in yeah, the state of Maine right now, now, there's legislation. Yeah. It's being dubbed the Trans Tourism Bill. So that Maine would become a destination for affirmative care to the point of the state taking over custody of children and making it into the borders of the state, even if they're from a different state. Right. Obviously, this is a concern for anyone in a, in a Christian perspective, Adventist or not. What is your opinion or your thoughts around Christians involving themselves at the state level when these kinds of issues come up? Because it's kind of a Oh, yeah. I would say absolutely get involved and speak out. Um, what's interesting to me is all this movement by states in the United States to do this affirming here when countries that are much less conservative who have been following this path for many years are now bringing a halt to it and saying, we're damaging children. This is now illegal for you to, to do this. But we're, we seem to miss the, the message. But yes, we speak out here in Baltimore. Yeah, but oh, you're yes. not going to see a YouTube video like that. That's Samuel. See Victoria, yes.